Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Jorge Roig, Associate Professor of Law and Director of Neighborhood Programs at Truro College Jacob D. Fuchsberg Law Center. We will discuss his article, A Quantum Congress, which was published in the Chicago Kent Law Review. So welcome to the to the podcast, Jorge. Thank you. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. So I I read your paper last night and and glanced over it again this afternoon. And I got to say, it's one of those. It's like one of my favorite kinds of papers because it's both like hilarious but also really thought provoking. And at the end of the day, I, I totally agree with it. Although I'm not sure I'm supposed to, um, perhaps because it appeals to so many of my prejudices. So I'm so glad that uh, somebody recommended that that I talk to you about it. Well, thank you. I, I'm honored to to be here with you today, and 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 thanks. I think that was the idea behind the paper. Okay. So so it at, at the end of the day, it's really an article about democracy or kind of the goals of democracy, it seems to me, and the form that democratic governance takes. So, so what is the, what is the kind of the problem you see? What, what, what's the problem or problems that kind of motivated you to write this paper proposing the, uh, the, the modest solution that you propose? So, um, you know, I, I reread it today also, cause it's been a while and, um, and it was interesting to think about it, you know, after a couple of years and everything that's been happening in the in the country and in politics recently. I think the the main problems that um, that inspired it have only exacerbated in the past couple of years. Uh, and it's basically this idea that that the country is really being controlled by a very very small minority of people who are exceedingly uh, wealthy, um, and and that democracy has really been taken from the hands of the people. Mm, mm, mm. And you, you you point to this really fundamental tension between like democratic governance and free speech values and how they've come increasingly in tension with with each other. I wonder if you, if you could talk a little bit about those two values, you know, kind of where you think that problem comes from and and why you think it's so intractable. Yeah, you know, uh, more specifically, I think one of the things that inspired it was also, and and the whole idea of of random selection of people uh, to to serve in in Congress or in a, a legislative body um, was something that had been sort of uh, scurrying around my head for a long time. But when Citizens United came out, and particularly when I saw the way that Citizens United was being interpreted and, and talked about in, you know, in the general discourse, it, it became a pet peeve of mine that there are some very important truths about free speech in Citizens United that were being sort of uh, ignored by, by the discourse surrounding the, the case. Uh, and so going more to your quest, specifically to your question, um, the idea that we are going to, you know, control the participation of actors in the political process and in the political discourse um, seemed problematic to me, right? I, I am a big proponent of free speech and defender of, of the First Amendment. And, and I saw a conflict there between what is definitely a problem we see in society of the ultra wealthy having more and more control, but at the same time trying to solve that problem by limiting free speech, which I don't think is the way forward. Right, right. And and so, you know, you, you in the beginning of the paper, you kind of look at some other reform proposals that that people have made and and really point out how they're either inadequate or kind of not even really designed to accomplish the goal that 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 people think that they're that they're for. I wonder if you could just kind of briefly talk about some of those. Like sort of when other people say we can fix the problem this way or that way, why aren't they right? So I I think the problem is uh, again that the focus on Citizens United has been um, kind of misplaced, I think. Uh, you know, a lot of the problems that 
that people are trying to solve didn't arise with Citizens United. They were problems that really arose with Buckley v. Vallejo and, and the cases in the 70s. So when people talk about, or, or even before that, right, if you're talking about the idea that, that corporations shouldn't have the same rights that natural people have, that is, you know, a problem that's been around us for more than 100 years. Mm. Um, and so the facts of Citizens United really have to do with, with the issue of independent expenditures or another way of, of saying it, just people and institutions who independently want to participate in the discussion of, of public issues, including campaigns and, and particular candidates. Um, and, and a lot of the proposals that have to do with corporate speech don't really address the issue, you know, have more to do with contributions to campaigns than with these independent expenditures. Right, right. And and so in your paper, you propose an alternative way of looking at solving the problem, which you describe as a quantum Congress or a, a lotocracy. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of what exactly do you mean by that? And where did this idea come from? So uh, basically the idea is if elections and their financing is so problematic, let's just eliminate them, right? And- <laughs> A modest proposal indeed. Exactly. Um, and, but the, and so it's an idea that I really had independently. But then when I started to do research, I realized that there's a very, very extensive um, tradition of this and that, you know, everybody knows that at least supposedly, right? Allegedly, democracy started with the ancient Greeks. and in, But nobody or very few people know that their version of democracy was precisely this one. It wasn't about voting as much as randomly electing people from the citizenry to serve as, as public officials. Mm. So so it's a, it's a story that has some, some quite a bit of, of pedigree. It's, it's, it came to me independently uh you being a copyright scholar can probably uh, <laughs> know what i'm talking about it, it was independently thought of but it certainly uh had been thought by a lot of people before me yeah i mean your your paper references in particular uh professor alex guerrero i think which i i'm i'm intrigued to check out some of his work which sounds very interesting Yes. You know, I haven't reached out to him uh, and I've been meaning to for a long time. And it's one of those things that, you know, you you sort of fall between the cracks. Um, But yeah, he has done some recent work on that. And uh, and so I drew from from some of his work for my paper. Okay, okay, so I, I, I want you to spend a little bit of time like explaining to people why random selection would be a good idea, because I love it, but I'm guessing that, you know, some listeners may be initially a little skeptical. Right. So, I mean, one sort of concise way of saying it is if we're going to take democracy seriously, let's take it all the way. Right. (laughs) Um, And one of the things that I that I like to point to when I talk about it is the jury system. Right. We we have a well-established system in our uh, system of justice that uses random selection of, of peers, right, of, of random individuals from our society to make some very important decisions. And so in that sense, it's not completely a crazy idea. We actually do this to some extent. And I think one of the great values of that, which we see in the, in the jury system, is that it incorporates in a proportional way the views, the very diverse views of everyone in our society, and it empowers every single citizen um, to to create a government of which they feel a part of. Mm. So, so how would a lawtocracy actually kind of work in practice? I mean, what would it look like, do you think, on the ground? I mean, I imagine there's lots of different ways it could look, but you make some proposals a sort of like sketching out what kind of a best practices for, for lotocracy would look like. Right. So I agree there's a, a million different ways this could look like. And Professor Guerrero has his own version uh, and proposals. 
Um, you could think of it at the federal level, which is what I did in my paper, but you could also think of it at the state level or even more so at the local level, right? Um, and, and I think there's a case to be made that if we were going to do this, we might want to try it out at the local level first. Um, there's a couple of important issues that I think need to be dealt with. Um, one of them is, and they're very practical concerns, right? One of them is what do people do when they get selected with the rest of their lives, right? They have jobs, they have families. And so one of the things that would need to be taken care of is ensuring that people get to keep their jobs. And, and again, that's something that we deal with in the jury system, and it seems to work. Um, because this would have to obviously be implemented through amendment to the Constitution if it were done at the federal level, uh, you could guarantee certain things in that amendment, right? Make sure that people were guaranteed their jobs back when they got back, uh, that they would be compensated for the time they spent uh, doing this, th this work and that their families could move with them to D.C. if that's going to be mm. where they're going to be living. Uh, another thing that I think would, would help in minimizing that that disruption is limiting the terms, right? Uh, not necessarily having, you know, senators serve for six years, but rather have a 12-month term or, a, you know, a, I think anything less than two years would be reasonable. Um mm. Other mm. issues that come up might have to do with, with again, the influence of outside actors and the outsized influence of, of the wealthy and the, and the corporate entities. And I think one of the things that really distinguishes this system from the one we have is that because there's no need to finance a campaign, you can completely outlaw any kind of kickback or, or pay or payment for uh, these individuals who are chosen as legislators. And I, I think a lot of the problems that we have in our system right now come from the ambiguity in the, in the uh, as I say in the paper, this legitimized, legalized corruption, right? In which mm -hmm. people are able to, to use all kinds of loopholes in the, in the election laws to, to contribute to campaigns and, and junkets and all kind give all kinds of personal benefits to the candidates in ways that are legal or at least arguably legal. Yeah. I mean, what struck me as interesting too, is you point out in the paper that, you know, for one thing, there are lots of ways that companies can buy influence with legislators and, and other officials, but they can also engage in activities that like people could reasonably impute to be sort of a form of corruption, even if the corruption isn't really there. And it seems like in a democratic system, the the appearance of corruption is damaging as well as actual corruption itself. Right, right. Uh, you know, I, I definitely, I think that that part of the important distinction in, in the systems would be sort of the categorical, um, that, that you would be much more able to say any money that that makes its way to these people's to the randomly elected legislators pockets is is inappropriate and so you can it, it's easier to monitor and to and to prosecute in that sense mm -hmm. like in a way the entire electoral system is a way of laundering bribes almost as it were that's what's going on right now right <laughs> yeah. yeah so so Ideally, what would the government look like if we did it that way? I mean, I guess in theory, we could set up a, a lotocratic government <laughs> any way we, we wanted to. Are there reasons to kind of maintain a governmental system that looks more or less like the one we have today? I mean, maybe it would be, quote unquote, easier to get there um, and we could you know, change it down the line, I guess. Or, you know, are there structural features that you think would make kind of the current system, structurally speaking, still attractive? Or should we look at, should we start thinking about uh, looking at the government a different way as well? So I, I think you could go either way, right? Uh, I think you can keep it simple, which is sort of the proposal that I make in the paper, and and basically, you know, substitute the elections for for random selection. Um, now, there's one thing that I think structurally would have to be added that's unavoidable, which is 
uh, some kind of uh, advisory body that would help these randomly elected individuals um, know what they're talking about, basically, right? <laughs> um, and to some extent, you know, propose legislation, have a legislative agenda that that survives the relatively short terms of these le legislators. Uh, to have some continuity, some institutional memory, et cetera. And I, I think of it sort of like the Congressional budget, budget Office right now, right? Some kind of nonpartisan career service type of institution. Um, on the other hand, you could go all out. And so I've seen proposals, I, I think from Professor Guerrero, but, but maybe from others, um, that would rethink the whole administrative bureaucracy, right? And sort of implement these kinds of processes, not just in the legislature per se, but also in the administrative slash executive branch. Um, you know, that that gets a lot more complicated, it seems to me, and <laughs> and, and less politically feasible if the, if we can talk of political feasibility yeah. at all. In this <laughs> Oh man. So so let's talk about the mechanics then, right? You know, now that now that we're moving into like implementation phase and all, like how would this work? How how would we go about like actually selecting people to be representatives? Would people have a choice? Would there be people who would be excluded? Like what what might that look like? You know, that's a great question. I don't really go into that in the paper, but uh, obviously I've thought a bit about it. Uh I, again the the reference to the jury system seems appropriate to me. Um, I also mentioned the, the institution of conscription in the paper, right? We, we force everybody over the age of 18, well, all males up to until now. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, <laughs> there's some litigation about that going on right now. I, I, uh -huh. um, anyway, uh, we force people to, you know, to, to uproot their lives and go, you know, put their lives in danger and, and, and die for our country. Why shouldn't we allow those people to, to participate in the, in the creation of the government? So I think it, it could be rather open-ended, maybe have a minimum age like we do with, with juries and, and conscription. Um, maybe exclude, you know, certain people that are, uh, very ill and might, and, and, and it might be impossible for them to participate. But other than that, I would, you know, I would leave it wide open, uh, no educational requirements, no wealth requirements, yeah. you know, everybody and everyone. Right. Right. It's a very Roman Frisca sort of approach, right? Like not everyone's a, a Brandeis and a Holmes. Exactly. And I mean, you know, the, the law of large numbers takes care of everything, right? Yeah, <laughs> of course it does. Of course it does. <clears throat> well, I, I will say in some respects, it, it does remind me of my favorite story about civil procedure, which is the lottery, um, right? Yes, uh, yeah. But it's somewhat, it's, it's a somewhat more, um, a, a, a somewhat more, uh, pleasant lottery system that you're right. describing. I and mean, it sounds like service would be a burden, but not such a terrible burden. Right. I was, I was actually rereading that just like a week ago. <laughs> That's great. Before, before you, you told me about this program. Oh man. I love it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so what about like, I, I mean, how do you think that would work? I mean, could people like decline? to serve if they wanted to? Or, you know, would there be a, a way for people to like kind of say that they were somehow not qualified or like, you know, they were suffering in some way that didn't allow them to like serve as a legislator or executive branch official in that way? You know, the way I conceive it, I, I think it would have to be very, very extraordinary circumstances to mm. keep people out because any any limitations that that you allow will you know can be misused um to influence the the constituency right of of the body mm -hmm. and 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 so I'd be afraid that if if you let people choose then there's going to be special interest paying people to stay out of the system right um and mm -hmm. and, and and so one way of, of dealing with that, I think, would be to just compensate people handsomely, you know? Mm. Um, <laughs> Make it attractive. Sweeten the pot. 
Right, right. I mean, uh, how much money do we spend on Congress right now anyway? So I, I don't think it would increase the budget very much. <laughs> this is a fair point, right? They get paid well, well higher than the, the median American salary. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. So if, if you pay, you know, the median American 100,000 bucks to, to do this a year, they're probably, you know, most of them are going to be very happy about it. <laughs> Okay, so so would this only be a legislative proposal, or would it go to the executive branch, or 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 maybe even the judiciary branch as well? I've seen it as a legislative proposal. I think you know when you get particularly to the judiciary, um, we have a role for the jury that I think serves us well. I'm a fan of the jury, as you know, you might have been able to tell. Mm -hmm. um, but we do need some expertise in judges. If anything, I think we need more expertise in judges, particularly in, in areas of law um, that you and I write about, like uh, patent law. I, <laughs> I think we have quite a bit of a problem with the lack of expertise in the judges there. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of the executive, I think at least uh, in a big part of the executive branch, I, I still... I still am compelled by, by the notion that expertise is important in, in a lot of executive agencies. So I wouldn't want the EPA to be just populated by random people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in, in the paper, you talk about some potential like remaining avenues for corruption and why we shouldn't be too worried about them. Um, but you also note, as you said earlier, that, you know, there are earlier versions of this, like in ancient Greece, and also even some kind of arguable versions of it happening right now, like you point to an example in, in California. So I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those potential problems and why you think we shouldn't worry about them, and also whether there are any problems from previous implementations that we might anticipate and, and potentially avoid going forward. So there's quite a bit there to tease out. One, uh, so one thing that I mentioned earlier was you know, the idea of direct payments from special interest groups to, to these individuals. And I think you know, you have to think comparatively. Uh, will it be worse than what we have today? I would think not because we're making things a lot more clearly illegal. But one aspect that uh, troubles me a bit more is the idea of the employers of these individuals, right? Uh, when you come back to your former employment, are you going to get kickbacks because you voted on legislation in a way that benefits your employer? Um and what I thought about that was, well, what are the chances that an employer in any particular legislative session is going to have a controlling majority of employees being randomly selected? The chances are pretty slim. And so um, I think there, there is, you know, it would be difficult for any particular employer to, to be able to, to control the outcomes in any particular legislative session. The other thing is you might think about this as as a positive way of, you know, accountability and 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 representation. If an employer has their employees voting on their behalf there, well, maybe that's a good thing because they're representing the interest of, of another constituent. Right. Uh, <laughs> so so that's something that I think is worthy of more thought and debate. Um, with respect to to the situations in the in the near past that that have used these kinds of methods, the California situation is really interesting, and I and it seems to me like successful. So they used random selection of members to a commission that was charged with redrawing the districts, the elect electoral districts in California. And it seems to have yielded much less gerrymandered, more representation, representative and, um, and competitive districts in, in that state. So it seems to have worked there. Mm. Then the counter example is Iceland, which uh, used it's it, it, basically what I, what I like to think of as a wiki constitution, right? They, they were trying to crowdsource 
um, a new constitutional structure, particularly after the 2008 crisis, which hit Iceland particularly badly. Um, and they went through a process in which they randomly selected some some people to to form part of a commission. Then they um, gathered input just from you know at large in the population. And then finally, the whole after they had written a new constitution, the whole thing collapsed when it went before the parliament. Right, so the political unfeasibility of the thing uh, was manifested there. Um, the other thing to consider about Iceland is there are like fifteen or twenty people in Iceland, right? <laughs> it's a very small country population wise, so. It, the, the issue of scale, I think, is important to consider too. Okay, so I I, I got to say that reading your paper, like in the background, was this kind of looming question that I felt like was almost being asked with a laugh, which is sort of why democracy? What is it for? What do we want to accomplish? Like, what's what's the goal here? Like, what are we trying to do when we say we want to do democracy? And I felt like this paper was really a fascinating reflection on why we value the idea of democracy in the first place. And I wonder if you could reflect on that for a minute. That, that's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, certainly I think at least part of the intent of the paper was to stimulate this kind of, of rethinking of, of, of things that we take for granted, right? Um, what is the, you know, I, I was surprised reading, rereading it today that I cited to, to Bork um, <laughs> in, in terms of, of the, the meaning and the fundamental value of the, of the free speech clause. Um, Another thing that comes up is this idea of representative democracy. I think, you know, a great deal of of this debate has to do with what do we mean by democracy? There are many different types of democracy. And, and our constitution uh, favors a very particular one in which I think everything is weighed towards... Um, Cons I want to. I don't want to use terms that are too loaded politically, but a certain conservation of the of the of, of the order, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are we are very far from a direct type of democracy in which every single human being participates in every single decision, and we but but we fill our mouths with you know PNs to democratic government and self-governance and all this stuff when when really what we have isn't quite that right and so as i said earlier if you're going to take democracy seriously let's take democracy seriously you know let's go mm -hmm. all the way let's just randomly let every single individual participate and see what happens <laughs> uh, and i think that is a very very scary proposition for some people in our in our society yeah, 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 yeah. I think you're right. And I think that that's so important. And one of the reasons I found this paper so incredibly like amusing and thought provoking and convincing. I mean, like I want lotocracy and I want it now. <laughs> so, so, so Jorge, in closing, how do we get there? How do I get my lotocracy? Oh, wow. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is a free speech paper, right? So at the end yeah. of the day, we gotta start talking about it. And 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 in that sense, I I wanna before we close, I wanna give a shout out to Lat Crit Latino Critical Legal Theory, which um, stimulated my actually putting down these ideas on paper as part of a, a group project for relatively new scholars, and and. The stated purpose of, of this project was take your most out-of-the-box idea, right, and, and do something with it and run. <laughs> and and they in that sense, that gave me the freedom to 
to do something that was funny, that was thought provoking, that was that was scary. Um, and and if we don't start talking about it, we're not going to get there. So I think just just the fact that that we are discussing this on this podcast and that some other folks might hear about it and think about it is a step in the right direction. And look at Iceland. I mean, again, Iceland is a very small place, but they went very far um, into implementing something like this. Awesome. Well, the, the paper was most bodacious, Jorge. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast. It's a great pleasure talking to you. Well, I am deeply flattered and, and deeply thankful for, for you having me here. How much do you know about politics? Seated in our audience tonight are 250 people who have gathered here to take the official Robin Dow National Political Survey Test with us. My name is Alan Robin, and here together with Earl Dowd and John Cameron Swayze, we are going to try to help you determine just how much you know about politics and politicians. Use the test blank and score along with us here in the studio as we begin the test. 